And this video contains the notes for section 2.6, which are limits involving trigonometric functions. Um, there's one important result, uh, or actually two important results, that yield a lot of other interesting consequences. And um, I'm just going to go through quickly. There are some situations in uh, calculus where we will prove something, but the proof is really a means to an end, and it's the end that's important. This is one of those cases. So um, I'm just going to tell you very briefly that there is something called the, uh, sometimes it's called the squeeze theorem, sometimes it's called the sandwich theorem. And it basically states, without going into all the nitty-gritty detail, that if you have two functions, let's say this one's called f of x, and let's call, say that this one is called g of x, and those two functions at one particular point here have the same limit. Now you can see how this function is doing its own thing, but just they just come together and sort of kiss each other right there. And then if there's a third function that's always trapped in between those two, then it must also have the same limit here. And that seems like incredibly obvious, right? And if this thing is forever trapped between f of x and g of x, then how could it not go through that same point? But remember, we're talking about limits here, so it might be a situation where it's not defined at that point. So that's the basic idea. If you can come up with an inequality that has one thing trapped between the other two, and you know the limit of this side, the limit of this side, then you can get the limit of the one in the middle. That's the basic idea. So uh, again, um, we're gonna I'm going to try to now come up with an, that inequality. And uh, this is still means to an end here. The end here is important, not so much how we get there. right? So um, I think you could even, if you were so inclined, could even kind of just chill out and watch this. It's not super, super important that this is in your notes. All right, so I'm going to draw a little diagram here. And I'm going to include in it some triangles. So I'm going to use some principles from geometry to get um, the results, the inequality that I'm looking for. Okay. Now, I'm going to call this angle theta, right? And this is the first quadrant of the unit circle. So that would be the point, oops, 0, 1. And this would be the point 1, 0. Now, um, I could fill in some information. I know if this is the unit circle, then the x-coordinate right here, that would be cosine theta, right? And the y-coordinate right here, that would be sine theta, right? And um, what about this? It turns out this is a, a very nice sort of geometric way of visualizing the tangent function. Is this is theta, this is 1, and if you think about this equation right here, I'll just kind of write it off to the side here, but we know that tangent of theta is equal to opposite over adjacent, and the adjacent here is 1. So if you multiply that to the other side, that opposite side here actually is tangent of theta. And you can see here, so as you look higher and higher, you can see how the tangent um, is well outside the unit circle, right? And here, if you, this is 45 degrees, which it looks 45-ish here, and it would be 1. Um, anyway, so uh, now I'm going to look for expressions for the areas of three different figures in this diagram. First of all, what's the area of this triangle? You look for the area of this triangle, that's this one right here. It has a base of 1 and a height of sine theta. Now clearly, just by looking at the diagram, the area of that is less than the area of this little pizza slice here, right? So that's less than the area of the pizza slice, right? This is like the pizza with no crust. This has the crust on there. And then that's also less than the big triangle, right? That big triangle here, which has a base of 1 and a height of tangent theta. 
right? That's just from simple geometry there. Okay, now um, I think these are easy to find the area of. This is just one half base times height, so that would be sine theta over two less than, and this is just one half base times height, that'd be tangent theta over two. What's the area of this pizza slice? Well, uh, remembering that we're in radians, I've got this much of the whole circle. Now theta is an angle measured in radians. If I had two pi, then I would have the whole circle, but I only have this much of it. So I've got like this fraction, whatever angle I have here, divided by two pi. So in other words, like if this were pi over four, pi over four over two pi would be one eighth. I would have one eighth of the whole circle. And the area of the whole circle is pi r squared, pi times the radius squared. So that's the fraction of the whole circle I have. That's the area of the whole circle. Multiplying those together, the pi's cancel out. I get theta over two. Okay. So that's the area of that. Now, um, I think clearly I can get rid of the twos, right? So I have sine theta is less than theta is less than tangent theta. Okay. Now I'm going to do something a little bit um, unusual. I'm going to flip all of these things over. Now since they're all, I mean, from this, this is all like geometry, we're talking about figures that have positive areas, so these are all positive numbers, this diagram here, so I'm going to flip them all over. And if you have an inequality, like 1 is less than 2 is less than 3, and you flip all those numbers over, 1 flipped over is 1, that would be 1 half, that would be 1 third, then the direction of the inequalities change. All right, so I'm going to flip that, 1 over sine theta, I'm going to flip this, 1 over theta, and I'm going to flip this, and since tangent is sine over cosine, now it's going to be cosine theta over sine theta. Okay? And then, last but not least, I'm going to multiply the whole inequality through by sine of theta. And since theta is a positive angle here, that's a positive number, so it won't mess with the inequality signs. If I multiply this piece by sine theta, the sine thetas cancel out top and bottom. I get cosine theta less than sine theta over theta less than 1. All right? That's the inequality that I need. Now, uh, what I'm interested in is, what is the limit as theta approaches 0 of each of these expressions? The limit as theta approaches 0 of this, well, you can just plug the 0 in. Cosine of 0 is 1. The limit as theta approaches 0 of 1, well, 1 doesn't care about what theta is, so that's just 1 all the time, right? That's just 1, 1, 1, 1, doesn't care. And then in the middle, this is the interesting part. Um, this is trapped between these two, so its limit must be 1. But in fact, if you tried to plug 0 into this, the sine of 0 is 0, it's a 0 over 0, but it must be equal to 1, and that's the result that we're looking for. So you see what we did? We trapped, we found a way of trapping sine theta over theta in between these, and um, we got the result we were looking for. I just want to show you one more thing real quickly to uh, seal the deal. If you want to look at a graph, you could graph, here is the graph of cosine x, here's the graph of 1, and then in between those two should be sandwiched the sine of x over x. I'm going to go to my window before I graph it, you should always do that. x values, we could go from, oh say, how about negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. And y minimum, 0 should be fine. I'm going to go a little bit bigger than 1 so we can see what's happening up there. <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and graph. You're going to see them graphed in the order that I put them in. Cosine x will be graphed, right? That should be the bump of the cosine curve there. And then the constant function 1. And then this one will be trapped in between the two. So let's go ahead and look at that. Oh, it's going to graph them all at the same time. Cool, because I'm in simultaneous mode. And then, whoop gets squeezed between those two. So this bottom one is the cosine function, the top one is y equals 1, 
and squeezed in between them is the sine x over x. Now if I look at the table, and that's my sine x over x, and I go to, I try to plug 0 into this. All right, let me go and uh, table set 0, and we can make this some small number like that. Oops, and I meant to go to the table. You can see that at 0, the cosine function is equal to 1. Of course, our constant function is always equal to 1. If I go over here, this is error, right? That's the 0 over 0. But we just justified using this idea that, in fact, the limit as x approaches 0 and this is the result. This is the part that's important. So if you were just kind of watching along, uh, eating some popcorn, then this is the part that we need to write down. We'll call it a theorem. That the limit as x approaches 0, sine x over x is equal to 1. That's a new limit for us. Right? How did we justify that result? We used that squeeze theorem idea. And um, there's another result that you can get in a very similar way. You can look in the book if you're interested. I'm not going to go through all the geometry stuff again. It's also true that the limit as x approaches 0 of cosine x minus 1 over x is equal to 0. And uh, the rest of this section is really just using these two results to get, some, um, to get other results. So let me show you some examples. Um, what's the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of x over 5x? Well, one of the things we know about limits is if you just have a number, like a constant multiple like that, you can bring it to the outside. So that's the same as the 5 on the bottom. I can bring out as a 1 -fifth to the outside of the limit. All right, see what I did there? I took the 5 to the outside of the limit. And I know that the limit is uh, x approaches 0 of sine x over x is 1. So 1 fifth times 1 is just 1 fifth. All right, that's easy enough. How about the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of 4x over 3x? How do we deal with that? It's a little bit trickier. I could take the 3 to the outside. sine of 4x over x. Now, the, the tricky thing here is if we could get, if this was the same as this, and maybe I should have done here, let me just squeeze in another example here to justify one of my steps here. How about sine of 2x over 2x? Well, I'm without actually taking any numbers out or doing anything crazy here, I'm going to try to convince you that the answer to this is 1. In fact, I'm going to try to do it without doing any more steps. Isn't it true that as x approaches 0, 2x is also approaching 0? So as long as this thing is the same as what you have on the bottom, as long as it's 2x over 2x, those two things are behaving just like an x that's going to 0. You could like invent a new variable and make a substitution there, but I'd like you to understand this in an intuitive way, that if x is going to 0, then so is 2x, and these two 2x's, those, those two x's are approaching zero exactly how like some other variable would approach zero, right? So you could say, uh, very formally, we could say, well, let's let u equal 2x, right? And then we could rewrite the limit. So the limit as what happens to u as x approaches zero? Well, if x is approaching zero, so is 2x. So that would still be u approaches zero. And then that would be sine of u over u. And now it looks like what our definition is, right? Variable approaches 0, sine of variable over variable, so that's equal to 1. So as long as these two things match up, then uh, we're good. We're looking at that piece of the limit will be 1. All right, let me go back up to this now. So using that idea, sine of 4x over x, if I could have a 4 here on the bottom, then um, that would go to 1, right? Now, I can have a 4 on the bottom. 
sine of 4x. I would like to insert a 4 here. Now, you can't just go putting 4s into expressions and hoping that they're still equal, because of course it wouldn't be. We're dividing this by 4. So to balance out dividing by 4, I have to multiply by 4 out here. This is an idea that we'll use in a lot of different contexts throughout the year. Uh, so I'm dividing by 4 here, that's fine as long as you multiply by 4 here. It's like I'm multiplying the top and the bottom both by 4, right, which is allowed. I just kept the 4 inside and the, that 4 outside. So sine of 4x over 4x is just, that's 1 times 4 thirds. And I'd like to go back to the beginning here and look at this. Did you notice that it's just the ratio of those numbers? Isn't that nice? So after a while doing these, you might start to pick up on that pattern. Let me show you a couple examples that are a little bit different. What about sine squared x over x? I don't know about you, but I have never ever liked this notation because that really means, that little 2 there, that really means sine x times sine x. Right? And I've got an x on the bottom there. So we know that this, sine x over x, that's going to 1. But as you plug in x approaches 0, this is going to 0. So that gives me 1 times 0, or 0. So having an extra sign on the top actually made it go down to 0. That changed things. Um, how about, what if there's an extra x on the bottom? What about that? Well, let's see. Um, that's the same as the limit as x approaches 0. Sine x over x times 1 over x. So this is going to 1. But this, as x approaches 0, this is blowing up. And it's actually like it's going to infinity on the positive side and negative infinity on the other side. It's a two side. The two sides of the limit don't agree. So that's actually does not exist. And um, one times it does not exist, of course. You can't salvage non-existence. So that does not exist. Uh, what about other trig functions getting involved? How about the limit as x approaches 0 of tangent 3x over 2x? Well, the tangent function is sine over cosine, right? So that's the limit as x approaches 0 of the sine of 3x over the cosine of 3x. Um, and then there's that 2x also in the bottom. I'm going to just kind of rewrite this. sine of 3x, and I'm going to put the 2x underneath this, times 1 over the cosine of 3x. I'm going to rewrite it like that. Now, I think from previous, uh, from a previous example, don't you know that this is going to be 3 halves? I don't think I need to go through the work there again, right? That's going to be 3 halves. And then when you plug x approaching 0, when you plug 0 into this, the cosine of 0 is 1. This is actually not a problem at all. Cosine of 0 is 1. So 3 halves times 1 is 3 halves. So look, if it's a tangent function instead of a sine function, then that still works just fine. Here's a, another crazy one. How about this? Sine of 7x over the tangent of 5x. Now look, if you had to take a crazy guess, what do you think the answer would be? What do you want the answer to be? Wouldn't it be nice if it was just 7 fifths? Let's see if we can figure out what it is and if it is, in fact, that. Um, the tangent of 5x is sine over cosine, and it's on the bottom, so it means it will be upside down. So I'm going to write that as sine over cosine, but since it's on the bottom, it looks like it's got a sine of 5x here and a cosine of 5x. I'm scattering these things out because I'm going to try to fill in some uh, some x's and stuff to make those um, to make everything come out nice. So um, take a second to make sure you understand that this is equivalent to this. I just left a couple
blanks in there so I can insert some stuff. This is tangent of 5x upside down, and there's my sine of 7x. All right, now um, you can multiply a fraction or an expression by anything you want as long as you multiply top and bottom. So what if I did this? Put an x top and bottom. Well, from previous examples, you know that this should just be 7 over 1. Now the limit of something, this, if it was sine 5x over x, it would be 5, but it's upside down, so that's just going to be 1 fifth. And as x approaches 0, cosine of 0 is just 1. So in fact, the answer is 7 fifths. Great. Um, couple more examples of this type. Uh, just watch out when you have things like, how about this, sine squared 3x um, over x squared. You might want that to be 3, but just be careful because when you square those things, you know that sine squared of something really means that there's two of those and x squared has two x's so that's three and that's three so three times three is nine and um, I'm gonna do a couple examples now of problems that are a little bit different than this um, I think these are you could call these composite function limits that involve some kind of trig here or there. So how about this? What is the limit as x approaches infinity? All the limits we've looked at so far in this section have been approaching 0. The limit as x approaches infinity of the cosine inverse of x plus 2 over 2x minus 5. When you, do a, when you run into a composite limit like this, you're going to evaluate the inside first just as you would uh, evaluate a composite function. So as x approaches infinity, what's happening to this? Well, this inside part, this is like a limit from, the, uh, from section 2, 3, right? This is um, highest powers 1 on the top and bottom. So the 2 and the 5 kind of fade off into obscurity, and it's really like just x over 2x, or in other words, 1 half. So this is going to 1 half. So really, this is just like ask, asking, what is the uh, cosine inverse of 1 half? What is the cosine inverse of 1 half? Um, I hope that you can do that without your calculator and um, without too much mental anguish. And uh, it is pi over 3. Right. This is one of the things, if we were going to spend a great deal of time doing a pre-calculus review, that we would review in class. But I'm not going to, because um, I find that it doesn't really, the people who know what this is, know what this is. And the people who don't, whether I review it or not, are still going to be kind of rusty with that. So um, if you are rusty with this, then you should either make an effort to talk to me about it and make sure you understand what's happening here, or find a way to uh, remediate any misunderstandings that you have yourself. Uh, but please come talk to me. I'd be happy to do that. Uh, and let's see. How about um, let's do one more. How about the natural log of x squared plus 2 over x cubed minus 1. So same idea. We look at the inside. Um, this is going to infinity. The highest power is on the bottom. That means the bottom is going to grow faster than anything else, which means this is going to be driven down to 0. So what's the natural log of 0. Well, you have to think about this. Um, well, there's, I guess there's a couple ways you could think about it. The way I think about it is, um, if you are familiar with the natural log function, which you should be, then you know that its graph looks like this. It 
goes through the point one zero and looks something like this. So as we approach zero, in terms of limits, although this is undefined, in terms of limits, we can say that this is approaching negative infinity. Right, because that's what the graph looks like. It doesn't exist on this side. This is not in the domain of the natural log function. So uh, that would be negative infinity. All right, that should be enough examples to get you through um, the problems in 2.6.